Starship fires up its engines, New Shepard returns to flight, and NASA sent a cat video to Earth from deep space. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Friday the 22nd of December, and there's much more to come this week in Spaceflight. Sponsored by Delete Me. NASA has successfully tested high-definition video streaming from deep space using laser communications. The test was carried out using the Deep Space Optical Communications payload flying on board NASA's Psyche spacecraft, which uses a laser to send information back to Earth. Unlike radio transmission, this laser beam is far more focused and carries a much higher bandwidth, meaning that it enables live video streams from much farther away without needing a giant antenna either on the satellite or on the ground. This was all just a theory up until December 11th, when a 15-second video of this adorable orange cat named Taters was sent from the payload down to Earth. The video took 101 seconds to reach Earth, but it did so uninterrupted in high definition and at a maximum data rate of 267 megabits per second. I know a lot of people who would pay a lot of money to have that kind of data rate at home. In fact, according to NASA, the connection between the receiving station at Palomar and JPL was slower than the data rates that they were getting from deep space. Now, by the way, Taters belongs to a JPL employee and in this video is shown chasing, what else, a laser pointer, a very common pastime for a cat. As we mentioned on a previous episode of This Week in Spaceflight, laser communication is not new. In fact, it's becoming more widely used these days, for instance, in inter-satellite communications on large satellite constellations, Starlink being a prime example of that. But this is the first time it's being used in deep space, where it achieves unmatched performance compared to radio transmissions. Who knows, maybe someday in the not so distant future, people like me or other adorable cats like Rory here will be broadcast to you over live streams sent from deep space. Meow you're talking. Now before we go over the launches this week, I'm gonna hand it over to Sawyer for a quick word about today's sponsor. All right, which one of you jokers out there sent me a letter from the Aries One fan club? And probably better question, how did you get my personal address? And is there a way to keep myself safe from data brokers who sell this information? There is, with the help of today's sponsor, Delete Me. Data brokers crawl the web searching for information and use it to build a profile of you. Many times it's as easy as checking public records, information you've posted, and even clues on your social media pages. I personally use Delete Me because even though I'm a public figure, there are still certain things I don't want out there all the time, like my address or even my phone number. And it's so easy to set up. I just put in my information and Delete Me's experts look to see what was public. It turns out in only seven days of searching, almost 1,500 listings were reviewed. Thankfully, as you can see, they've already removed 56 of those listings and they'll keep monitoring sites and repeat removals as needed. Go to joindeleteme.com NSF and use code NSF to get 20% off. Now to burn this letter. I'm never joining the Aries One fan club. And now let's take a look at this week in launches. Starting off the week, we had the launch of a Changzheng 5 on December 15th at 1341 UTC from the Wenchang Space Launch Site in China. It was carrying the Yaogan 41 satellite into a geosynchronous transfer orbit. It's unknown what the Yaogan 41 satellite might be, but given that it launched on China's most powerful rocket, and it seems to be headed for geostationary orbit, it's likely to be a new type of reconnaissance satellite. This type of satellite could essentially be a telescope pointed the wrong way, sporting a telescope with a large optical mirror capable of taking images of the Earth with a resolution of up to 2 meters per pixel. This kind of imaging capability would be of lesser quality than that of a satellite located on a low Earth orbit, but good enough to spot ships on the ocean and planes in the air, that sort of thing. The location would give an advantage to this satellite, making it capable of seeing a much larger area of the planet at any given time, and potentially being able to see multiple observation targets in a short span of time. Of course, this is all conjecture because as usual, there hasn't been any official confirmation from China about the nature of this payload. This week, we also had the launch of a Soyuz 2.1B with the frigate upper stage from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Liftoff took place on December 16th at 9.17 UTC from Site 316, carrying the second Arctica-M satellite into a Molniya orbit. 
This satellite is the second of the Arctica M series of Russian remote sensing and emergency communication satellites. This satellite will work alongside the first one on two different Molniya orbits that will provide constant 24-7 coverage over Russia. This week, we also had the launch of iSpace's Hyperbola-1 rocket from Site 95A at the Zhiquan Satellite Launch Center in China. Liftoff took place on December 17th at 7 o'clock UTC, and it was carrying the DEAR-1 satellite into a sun-synchronous orbit. The DEAR-1 satellite is a prototype of a recoverable experimental spacecraft built and developed by AS Space. The satellite also contains optical observation payloads and life science research payloads. A Falcon 9 launched on December 19th at 4.01 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. It was carrying a batch of 23 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage for this mission, B-1081, was flying for a third time and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas. With this launch, SpaceX has now launched 5,604 Starlink satellites into orbit, of which 378 have re-entered and 4,557 have moved into their operational orbit. We also had another Soyuz 2.1B rocket launching on December 21st at 848 UTC from Site 434 at the Plesetsk Cosmodrome. The rocket was carrying an unknown payload into a sun-synchronous orbit for the Russian Ministry of Defense. This payload may be given the designation of Cosmos 2573, plus or minus a number or two, as is usual from the Russian government for classified payloads. It's believed that the satellite may be perhaps the fifth BARS-M electro-optical surveillance satellite. Firefly's Alpha rocket launched for a fourth time earlier today, with the Fly the Lightning mission taking place out of the company's launch pad at Vandenberg. This mission was carrying Lockheed Martin's new wideband electronically steerable antenna on board a Nebula satellite bus manufactured by Terran Orbital. This payload will demonstrate faster on-orbit sensor calibration to deliver rapid capabilities to U.S. warfighters. This was Alpha's second flight demonstrating rapid response capabilities after the Victus Knox mission back in September of this year. The company executed payload processing and launch preparations in a similar manner to that mission, extending these capabilities beyond simple demonstrations. The weather had other plans, however, and the launch had to be postponed by two days right as teams were loading propellant on the rocket. This week we also had the return to flight of Blue Origin's New Shepard rocket. The mission, dubbed NS-24, lifted off on December 19th at 1642 UTC from Blue Origin's Launch Complex 1 in Texas. It featured the night flight of the fourth New Shepard booster in Blue's inventory, Tail 4. This booster had previously been used to fly New Shepard's crew missions and, after the loss of Tail 3 on the NS-23 mission, it seems to now be the new booster for cargo missions. The flight carried 33 payloads either on board the New Shepard capsule or attached to the propulsion module. The flight reached an apogee of 107 kilometers, and both booster and capsule successfully returned back to the ground in good shape. This mission came 15 months after the failed NS-23 mission, where the engine suffered a failure in flight, leading to an abort of the mission and subsequent mishap investigation. The investigation concluded that during the flight, the engine nozzle overheated due to a design change made on the engine's film cooling system that led to excessive heat. This overheating made the nozzle structurally fail and produce a thrust imbalance, which, in turn, led to the loss of control and an abort of the mission. Blue Origin hasn't said much about when crew flights may resume, but it could be that the company may just take a few more months, instead using these cargo flights to gather data on the engine fixes. SpaceX is now deep into testing of the pair of Starship vehicles that are set to fly on the third flight of the world's most powerful rocket. Last week, we talked about how the company had rolled Ship 28 out to the launch site back on December 14th. Since then, the vehicle has now completed engine testing and should be heading into preparations for its flight atop Booster 10. This engine testing involved a spin prime test on December 16th, followed by a six-engine static fire test on December 20th. This means that SpaceX tested the engines on the next ship in a span of six days from rollout to final static fire test, a record for the company. But the record-breaking pace doesn't end here, as SpaceX also rolled out Booster 10 to the launch site on December 18th. Of course, things don't go always as planned, and there were some delays getting the vehicle off its newly designed transport stand and onto the orbital launch mount. Just yesterday, on December 21st, SpaceX attempted to perform a static fire test of the booster. However, during the countdown, it seems like there was some sort of issue that prompted a hold in the count and eventually a scrub of the test. 
The launch pad systems have been revamped with new pumps and subcoolers that will add new capabilities for the third flight of Starship, but it also means that a new set of unknowns have been introduced into the equation. It could very well be that this abort had to do with the newly installed hardware, but sadly we don't have any official information about the reason for the scrub. However, another attempt could happen again soon. A road closure is set for December 22nd from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Central Time. A road closure is set for next week on December 27th during the 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Central Time window that we're used to by now. A successful static fire test of Booster 10 before the end of the year would definitely shatter all previous records of testing speed for Starship and would set up a new impressive precedent for the flights to come. SpaceX will still need to be cleared from a regulatory standpoint, mainly completing its mishap investigation report and presenting it to the FAA. This means a realistic launch time frame may be in the January to February months of next year. Starbase General Manager Kathy Leaders mentioned recently that the company is already working on licensing for not only Flight 3, but also Flight 4 of Starship, so hopefully we'll see a swift ramp up of Starship activity in the new year. And now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. We're going to start by catching up on two stories from last week since we now have updates to talk about. We mentioned that a number of SpaceX delays happen not only for launches, but also for the return of its cargo Dragon from the ISS. Well, right after we recorded that, SpaceX had to scrub a Starlink launch from Vandenberg due to unfavorable weather. Now instead, the company's next launch from the US West Coast will be the SARA-2 and SARA-3 satellites, and that Starlink mission has moved further towards the end of the year. Thankfully, after several more delays, the CRS-29 Dragon undocked from the ISS on Thursday, December 21st, and is on its return trip to Earth as of recording. Due to the Dragon departure delays, NASA had to delay the departure of the NG-19 Cygnus spacecraft to the morning of December 22nd, so by the time you're watching, it will probably have departed the station. The other story to catch up on is the impressive progress made by Relativity and its first complete EON-R engine. The company had performed a short duration burn of this engine last week, and this week it was able to perform a full duty cycle burn of the engine on the test stand. This happened not weeks or months after that shorter test, but merely a few days after. According to Relativity, the burn lasted for 143 seconds with the engine running at 70% power. Obviously, there will be a long road ahead for Relativity until it reaches full engine capability, but the pace at which they're developing a whole new engine and the thrust that it produces is quite remarkable. Here's to many more tests. Just 11 months after the first air launch from the UK, the first vertical launch spaceport has been fully licensed, marking a historic milestone for the future of European spaceflight. The Civil Aviation Authority, the British version of the FAA, has approved the site's use for orbital launches, which will take place over the North Sea from the most northerly point of the British Isles. This site has been eagerly anticipated by multiple launch providers from all over the world, including Edinburgh headquartered Skyrora, German rocket factory Augsburg and High Impulse, and American companies ABL Space Systems, Lockheed Martin, and even Astra. Everyone who works for NSF who's from the UK, including NSF actual Chris Bergen and this video's editor Ryan Caton, are certainly excited to see a launch from the country, although I'm not sure how excited they are to visit a location with a record high temperature of 23 degrees Celsius. ULA's Vulcan rocket received its payload this week, finally completing the first flight-ready Vulcan rocket. The company will now undergo a couple of weeks of testing of the rocket and payload inside of the Vertical Integration Facility as it readies for this rocket's first flight no earlier than January 8th. However, it's not the only ULA rocket seen on a launch pad this week. Our friend Harry Stranger was able to identify the final Delta IV Heavy horizontal on the pad in a recent picture by ESA's Sentinel-2B satellite. It looks like ULA is well underway, preparing for the swan song of one of the most famous orange rockets in the world. Since this is going to be the last episode of the year, let's take a look at what's coming up next week in spaceflight and also the following week. Starting off the week, we'll have a Falcon 9 rocket with the Starlink Group 632 mission from Florida. The four and a half hour window opens on December 23rd at four o'clock UTC. 
Later that day, another Falcon 9 is set to launch from Vandenberg carrying the Sarah 2 and Sarah 3 satellites for the German government. The two hour and 20 minute launch window opens on December 23rd at 12.56 UTC. A Soyuz 2.1V, yes, the one without boosters, is set to launch next week from Plisetsk with an unknown payload. The two hour launch window opens on December 27th at 6 o'clock UTC. SpaceX will try again next week to launch the USS F-52 mission on board a Falcon Heavy out from Florida. The four-hour launch window is set to open on December 29th at midnight UTC. NASA's Juno spacecraft is set to go through its 57th perigeove next week, which will include a flyby of Io, Jupiter's innermost Galilean moon. The flyby is set to take place on December 30th, with closest approach taking place at around 8.35 UTC. Starting off in the new year, it appears that the first launch of 2024 will be performed by India with the launch of a PSLV-DL rocket carrying the ExpoSat satellite. The four-hour launch window is set to open on January 1st at 2 o'clock UTC. There are also a number of yet-to-be-confirmed launches from China and from SpaceX. From SpaceX, we're still awaiting information on when the company may be able to launch the Avzon 3 satellite from Florida and when weather will allow that flight as well. From Vandenberg, the Starlink Group 7-9 mission could very well delay from the previously set launch date of December 29th at 5.09 UTC. There's also the possibility for a Starlink launch from the Cape on New Year's Eve or on New Year's Day as well. China's manifest is even more uncertain with a potential of up to five launches happening in the next week or so. But one thing is for sure, the space activity at the end of this year won't be taking a break. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. Thanks to Delete Me for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to visit joindeleteme.com slash NSF and use the code NSF to get 20% off. Happy holidays and happy new year from NSF. And we'll see you all again next year to recap this week and next week in spaceflight.